Jeju Forum is being held very successfully, and I would like to thank you all for joining this meaningful session. My name is Chuyun, or moderator of the session. Thanks for taking the time to be here with us today. Please allow me to begin the session. I would like to introduce to you chairperson of the session. Dong Yu Lee, Director General of Climate Change, Energy, Environment, and Scientific Affairs, our Bureau and Ministry of Foreign Affairs is with us. For over 25 years, he served at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and focusing on environmental issues. He was the head of the Climate Change Environmental Team, Councillor of the Korean Permanent Mission to the United Nations, and also he became a Deputy Director General of the Climate Change, Energy, Environment, and Scientific Affairs Bureau in 2018. And he has been actively involving in addressing environmental uh, issues. And and also, in March 2021, he was designated as also Director General of the Climate and also Environment and uh, Science. And also, he is in charge of management of PM 2.5 and air pollution and micro dust. Let me turn my microphone to Director General Lee. Please welcome him with a big hand. 네, 감사합니다. Thank you for introduction. My name is Tongyu Lee, Director General. And in May, President Moon visited the U.S. and had the U.S. Korea summit meeting with the President uh, Biden, and they talked about traditional issues, especially Korean Peninsula issues, and not only that, they talked about a wide range of global issues, including COVID-19 and climate change, space, and science and technology as well. In particular, major achievements were made in science and technology, including rock US Global Vaccine Partnership, for example, participation in the Artemis Agreement, strengthening space sector cooperation, promising practical cooperation to cope with the climate crisis and strengthening partnership in emerging technology. So in this session, we would like to review the achievement of the Korea-US Summit in Science and Technology and discuss the direction of Korea's science and technology diplomacy through US cooperation in the future implementation process. I would like to invite the second vice minister of the Ministry of Affairs for congratulatory remarks. And he was an ambassador to Sri Lanka and many other countries. And also he uh, served as a government representative for UNESCO Affairs and also deputy minister of multilateral and global affairs. Please welcome him. Good evening. Uh, I am the second vice minister of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Today, we're going to discuss about the reviewing outcomes of Korea-US summit and exploring measures for Im implementation focusing on science and technology. I'd like to express my deepest gratitude for uh, having this uh, session together. The uh, Korea summit this time was very successful in producing substantial results, especially the ally issue is related with the uh, nuclear, climate change, Spain, uh, space, vaccine, and others. So it is a juncture to uh, develop further in the expansion of our cooperation. And for the vaccine distribution, we provided the capability to provide the supply chains, thereby building a partnership for vaccine. And bilaterally, we also agreed to have the uh, supply chains cooperation and 6G and uh, semiconductor and other areas that we can cooperate together. The same is applied to the space area. We made a consensus on space study. We joined the Artemis um, arrangement and also signed the joint declaration so that the domestic space related development can go further. Among others, the range limit is uh, solved. Now the climate target 
and a carbon zero emission target should also be the target area for us to cooperate further. The implication is all done, and there are other areas that we have to go further in detail and to advance the result. Maybe by the end of July or in August, we will have the vice ministerial level discussion to talk about the concrete action that we can do together. Today, we have many experts to talk about the creative methodologies and measures to have the concrete measures for the uh, discussions in the CORA Summit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Second Vice Minister. And now I would like to invite the President of the Science and Technology Policy Institute, Mummi Ok. She is an expert in science and technology and policy with a background as a member of the 20th National Assembly, advisor to the President for Science and Technology, and also Vice Minister of the Ministry of Science and ICT. And from January 2021, she served as President of Science and Technology Policy Institute, or a STEPI, and promote science and technology diplomacy by establishing a dedicated research department. Please uh, welcome the President with a big hand. Good afternoon. My name is Miyok Moon, President of STEPI. Right after uh, lunch, we have attended a session hosted by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs on the importance of science, technology, diplomacy. And having this forum as an opportunity, I think it is all the more meaningful to talk about the outcome of Rock US Summit, especially focused on science and technology diplomacy. So personally, and also to the Institute, it is very uh, meaningful and pleasant. Uh, the direction of the science and technology uh, will be shared by the opinions of other researchers. And for science and technology diplomacy, in order to receive advice, we have, uh, I heard that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs organized the advisory committee. I would like to uh, thank you for your efforts. I appreciate it. So along with the advisory committee, our institute will also fully support your effort for the development of science and technology. And there was a Rock US Assembly meeting held in May this year. I used to be a scientist. I was a scientist. And I'm also an expert in a policy for SCT. I believe that science and technology is backing up the focus, backing up the center of our foreign diplomacy. And at the summit meeting, the two leaders reiterated that our alliance is based on reciprocality. And it was very interesting that they reiterated that our alliance is based on dynamism and also mutual uh, benefit. For the better future for the two countries, they promised the comprehensive uh, alliance. And building the better future uh, would need the science and technology of Japan. Global issues like COVID-19 or climate crisis, and also we need to play our role as a member of the international community. And the two leaders recognize the efforts made by the two countries, and they reiterated and promised to closely cooperate with each other to further strengthen the alliance. And one another important element is that for the international community, and on top of that, at the discussion session of the Convergence of Science, Technology, and Dipl Diplomacy, we talked about cooperation is important, and no less important is competition for the interest of one's own country. We have to have a core technology. We have to restore supply chain 
and also immigration issue raising around uh, southern part southern america and also people to people exchange all of which are new sectors for cooperation and to leaders affirm that we need to build a partnership in new areas. And as is mentioned by the second vice minister chair just now, there are core technologies and also new technologies that are arriving. For example, battery issues in response to environmental problems. When we drive electrical vehicle, then it comes with the issue of the hydrogen energy and how to capture carbon. And also we need to develop technologies for eco-friendly energy. And also the industry 4.0 would accelerate the development of technology within it. We also need to talk about AI and the next generation telecommunication network and also quantum technology and biotechnology, all of which are very new uh, technologies and they promise to closely cooperate in these uh, sectors, all of which uh, would uh, promote the alliance between the two countries. Up to now, even in uh, established the sectors that we built a strong cooperation, further effort will be uh, made. For example, space uh, development. Up to now, it took place at the level of government, but maybe we need to explore uh, space uh, travel, including the uh, private sector. And also the Korean government signed Artemis agreement and also nuclear uh, safety and non-proliferation. We have to secure the higher level of standards. And also we have to secure joint uh, participation in the nuclear uh, industry. In order to back all these sectors, we have to uh, strengthen cooperation in development cooperation. So between the two relevant organizations in two countries are also included in the joint statement as a item for building partnership, which is very meaningful. And today, President Moon hosted a multilateral uh, meeting and even with uh, the countries, the Latin American countries, he mentioned about increasing financial contribution to the countries, which was also mentioned between the two leaders, uh, between the US and Korea. So I think that would broaden the territory of our science and technology diplomacy. So I think what I have laid out to you will not just leave it as an ink on a paper. Implementation needs to be uh, followed. We have to lay foundation, meaning that we have to make a lot of effort. And we have to expand people to people exchange among experts. And also, we have to enhance capability of uh, uh, women. And that was also agreed by the two leaders. And I have laid out to you the outcome of the Rocky West Summit meeting. And for the last month, one month since the summit meeting at the Senate in the US, right after the summit meeting on 8th of June, Republican Party and Democratic Party showed the uh, bipartisanship and passed the bill on uh, core competition law. And I think it was an effort uh, to uh, show signs of a revising laws to befit the changing trend. So when changing the act or laws, they mainly emphasize the economy and trade. By doing so, they are aiming at rebuilding capacity on manufacturing as a person from science and technology arena in this sector, I think acts related to science and technology are also changing. There is an institution, NSF, but and that will be changed to NSTF. And Innovative Competition Act is related to that. And the outcome of R&D will be related to the production. That will be internalized. It will be mandatory. 
not only that, investment in high technology uh, will be expanded dramatically. So the key was uh, the scale and the, s the speed, because the basic sector has experienced the contraction because of the COVID-19. So for the next five years in Korea, one. Uh, $250 billion will be invested that is included in the new act. And that's something that we need to analyze further. We need to respond to that. And for the NSTF, the institution alone budget uh, will be increased by $2 trillion, meaning that they will really speed up what they do and they will scale up. So as the leader of the uh, science and uh, technology, they are going to uh, restore their state. And also, we had the uh, meeting yesterday on the advisory committee on science and technology. The revision on the reallocation of a budget was passed. So the budget for the major R&D will be around 23 trillion won. And for other R&D sectors, the scale and the size of the budget will be around 30 trillion won. So that includes the sectors that on which the two leaders uh, have uh, promised. And also for epidemics and pandemics, uh, we are going to invest around 500 trillion won. And for the three major sectors for innovation, for example, biotech and also system and future vehicles, 2.5 trillion Korean won will be increased. And for existing sectors that we have invested, Space uh, development budget uh, will be increased by 11 percent, near to 400 trillion Korean won. And also, quantum technology is a new area. And also, budget for that area is increased by 84 percent. According to NSTF, there is an initial list which includes quantum technology. I think it is the result of reflecting that. So basic technology and also supporting uh, young scientists, a huge investment has been allocated. So the increase of our uh, budget has been proactively done. And such changes are demonstrating that science and technology that two leaders talked about are very important. So our institute is conducting research on R&D and many uh, new sectors. In the future, strategy for investment and effectiveness will not only follow according to domestic conditions. We will take into consideration of relevant uh, conditions like how other countries are doing and we would like to guarantee the effectiveness of internal policies according to external conditions. So developing high technology and also contributing to the economic development of Korea was the uh, pre-existing focus of our policy. However, we found that that is not enough. We have to reflect the uh, international situation, for example, uh, agenda on high technology and also uh, forming new uh, areas. And uh, we know that science and technology will be foundation for all these. So such a discussion will be very active between bilateral relations and also we need to have uh, economic development at the multilateral level and we need to expand the efforts to converge different uh, areas. I think that uh, is a reiteration of the importance of science technology and as is mentioned by a second vice minister economy and security were well, the main issues only putting focus on uh, national uh, interests on top of that surrounding the science and technology we need to take into consideration of regulations are changing around the world and also how to protect and science and technology itself as well as the, the people in that area i think 
the arena of uh, diplomacy is expanding to include all the items that I laid out to you. So our upper hand in ICT uh, can be a very uh, useful tool. In order to make sure that becomes a tool for diplomacy, I think uh, our diplomacy and also science and technology need to be uh, converged with the back of a policy effort. In order to do so, in the previous session, a student, a journalist asked a question. Uh, the person mentioned that it's very new. So the research activity uh, by the uh, scientists is the very first scene for science diplomacy. I think it should be interpreted as a tool for science technology diplomacy and also activity at the international organization in science and technology uh, should be a part of the diplomacy for science and technology. So relevant institutions and also expert needs to be coordinated, needs to be systematically organized in order to provide a support for the decision made by the leaders and also to secure sustainability of our policy, all of which leads to tangible results. As I told you, in October 2019, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of ICT established a strategic direction for comprehensive cooperation partnership in uh, science and technology and diplomacy. Two years uh, have been passed and we are and the international community are changing huge are experiencing huge change. So we need to reflect that onto our, our policy again. We need to reflect on ourselves whether we are on the right track or not. So, of course, the increasing threat in the security and also in response to global issues, we need to use science and technology to respond to that. And based on that, uh, tasks were chosen, were included in that strategy. I think it is the right time for us to reflect on whether we are on the right track. Science and technology uh, diplomacy is really great thing, the wonderful thing. The humanity, we have co-prosperity target and do the work together. That is really good. And technology for co-prosperity of the world, we are working so hard. For example, in MOFA, we have the science and technology ODA doing that responsibility. As well as that, the experts in science and technology and also overseas citizens are also included in the target. So these policy plans, if they are well established, the summit of the leaders and government to government cooperation and bilateral discussion and meetings, it can lead to the in uh, the uh, the action for going further. I believe the summit uh, is something that call for this science and technology to go a step further by considering the ways and the concrete actions by establishing a well plan. One thing I the light to propose this time is uh, in the earlier session I proposed the same thing the we need to have a platform that can have the interface between different experts to go together and set the standard and the direction for the science and technology sectors so that we can have a common purpose and common target we have to have the venue to talk about it together as well as that, the relevant experts, not only about the government plans uh, to follow, we can propose the plan that we can have together and also can do some support for the experts. If we can go a step further, we can make the legal basis for them to do the work. Based on that legal basis, maybe we can put the responsibilities and roles of the experts and also have the dedicated agency to do the job and also the basic plan to pursue the plan and also can do the checking and inspection on the middle of the process. That can be the preparation that we can do. And in the process, 
uh, my agency, as we have done so much work, we will do the work and we will be part of that process in the effort. Not only our agency, but also other agencies where national research centers can, and also private sectors, we should have a platform that can include all the uh, private and um, public sectors expert together. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Moon. She highlighted the outcome of the Korea US summit and also shared uh, the changes which took place in the two countries. And as the feature of the summit meeting, she touched upon that the, they are going to be uh, further cooperating with each other based on reciprocality and also a uh, strong alliance. And also she talked about the uh, contribution plan and future plans of uh, STEPI, which has a long communicated expertise. And also the US Pass Innovation Competition Act. And also uh, she touched upon the implications of such change in the Senate in the US. And for connecting uh, science, technology, and diplomacy, she even proposed uh, to lay the foundation for it. So. When the panelists, uh, when you are given a chance to speak, I think it is worth to mention and share your ideas. Now is the time to attend the keynote uh, presentation. Speaker is Dr. William Koglantzer. He is a prominent expert in science diplomacy and the discussion of STI for SDG in the UN. And now he is currently a senior researcher at the American Science Promotion Association and chief editor of the world renowned journal Science and Diplomacy. Out of his busy schedule, he recorded his presentation on science and technology diplomacy in the post corona era, opportunities and challenges for Korea and the US. Please attend the uh, presentation by Dr. Ko Glatze. Uh, well, good morning. Uh, it's a great pleasure and an honor to speak with you uh, at the beginning of this session on convergence of science and diplomacy at the Jeju Forum. Uh, my name is, is Bill Ko Glacier. I'm going to talk briefly about international science diplomacy in the post-COVID era opportunities and challenges for the Republic of Korea and the United States. Uh, as, as we all know, President Biden and President Moon met on uh, May 21. And they talked about a number of issues. Uh, I'm especially going to be addressing some of those issues and what uh, science diplomacy might be able to, uh, uh, to help contribute. Uh, I'm going to show a few slides, so if you'll bear with me one second, I will try to share them. There. My, uh, my background, I was a physicist and, uh, and a university professor, but uh, I spent the last 30 years basically working in science policy, science diplomacy, and science and sustainability. Uh, and I'm just giving my brief uh, perspective on science diplomacy. We used to talk about it as science and diplomacy, science and international affairs, science and foreign policy. And dropping the and and saying just science diplomacy, I think, really indicates that science diplomacy is a tool or a mechanism for accomplishing concrete goals, uh, whether it's uh, science helping to advance diplomatic goals or whether it's diplomacy helping to advance scientific goals, advance the scientific enterprise. Both, I believe, are, uh, I would call science diplomacy. I'm just going to give you several examples of 
types of science diplomacy at least come from my my experience. Uh, as I said, I went to the National Academy of Sciences in 1991 to head the international office and soon became executive officer overseeing the expert studies, uh, which address mainly domestic issues, but lots of international issues as well, including some which you could call science diplomacy initiatives. In fact, the academies are three academies, science, engineering, and medicine. Together, they do about 200 studies a year. Uh, in 2011, uh, I went to become a science and technology advisor to the U.S. Secretary of State. Uh, did that for three years. That was under uh, Clinton and Kerry. Uh, when I uh, retired from, uh, from the government, uh, I went to the American Association for the Advancement of Science part-time, but I also co-chaired an advisory committee created by the UN Secretary General to advise on the role of science, technology, and innovation for its advancing the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. At the, uh, the academies, uh, I'm going to give you some examples of things which you really could call science diplomacy among the many studies that we did. Uh, a number of them are done with uh, the science communities in Asia addressing issues that were important to our countries. For example, this one on air pollution issues between the U.S. Science Academies and the, uh, the Chinese Academy of Sciences. And you could call these track two science diplomacy because our purpose was not only to address important issues, but also help to build up the capability of our partners in other countries to become more important advisors uh, to their own governments. Uh, besides China, a number that were done with Japan, even with developing countries, Indonesia, uh, with Russia, but also other places uh, around the world. Uh, the Gates Foundation funded 10 years for the U.S. Academy to help the, uh, the science academies in Africa become more important advisors uh, to their governments. And it was also with uh, countries where there were strange relations between the United with the United States. A good example is with Iran. From 2001 to 2016, uh, the science academies in both countries uh, worked on a number, had a number of workshops each year, not dealing with nuclear issues, but dealing with uh, energy issues, with uh, uh, environmental issues, public health, uh, worth protection. Uh, and it's very likely that these uh, Workshops will continue again under the, the new uh, U.S. administration. Before, they were actually quite useful in helping uh, facilitate what became of the government negotiations dealing with the tougher issues between the United States, Iran, and, uh, and other countries. Also, a number of studies that were done looking at issues related to science and technology and innovation competitiveness in the world. A famous woman that was a bipartisan request from the Congress in 2005. Uh, looking at science and technology strategies of, uh, of different countries, implications for the United States. And there were two studies done in 1999 that uh, had an impact on my future career. Both of them were not funded by the government, but were funded by, uh, by private sources of funding. This one on the pervasive role of science, technology, and health in foreign policy. I uh, made a number of recommendations. Uh, Secretary Madeleine Albright accepted uh, a number of them, and one of them was to create the position of the science and technology advisor to the Secretary of State. The, uh, the second study that also came out in 1999 was called Our Common Journey, A Transition Towards Sustainability, the Role of Science and Technology for Facilitating Sustainable Development. And the key word is journey. It really emphasized that it was a journey collaboration between the science and technology community, decision makers with the public, uh, learning by doing a true roadmap that was corrected over time uh, to get us on the path of uh, sustainable development. And that actually had influence when I became, when I was appointed to that uh, UN advisory body. When I was science and technology advisor to the Secretary of State, one thing that struck me was no matter what country that I was engaged with on science and technology, it was true for every country, no matter their level of, of development, uh, how technologically advanced they were. They, they all had the same top priority they wanted to talk about was how science and technology can stimulate innovation, economic development in this globalized, competitive, interconnected world. Uh, they all had ambitious plans to increase their capabilities. They saw that it was essential for their prosperity and security, and they were willing to modify policies and investments to accomplish the goals. This was actually a great asset for the diplomacy of the advanced countries uh, technologically like the United States. They all wanted, they were looking for models 
and uh, other countries they can engage with on these uh, on these issues. Uh, in 2015, uh, again, I think as you all know, that the United Nations of negotiation that produced the 17th Sustainable Development Goals of the UN 2030 Agenda, and the diplomats recognized that they had to do a better job of harnessing uh, science and technology. Uh, and so they created something called a technology facilitation mechanism, which consisted of uh, a multi-stakeholder annual forum at the UN, the STI forum, interagency task team of UN agencies and other international organizations, and a 10-person advisory group called a 10-member group. And I, I was the, the co-chair of that first group from 2016 to uh, 2018. And uh, we were very much focused on how to turn the aspirational rhetoric of the 2030 agenda into really concrete actions. And a lot of that was gonna to have to be accomplished at the, uh, the national and subnational level. Uh, and so we, beginning back in 2016, we were emphasizing action plans and roadmaps, STI capacity building and strengthening science advice. And one issue that I lobbied strongly for this roadmap initiative, science, technology, and innovation for the sustainable development goals roadmaps. Uh, what this roadmap is actually the intersection of a country's national plan, its plan for increasing capabilities in science and technology, and its plan for accomplishing uh, the sustainable development goals. And at the UN, uh, over the last couple of years, it produced a, a guidebook for producing these roadmaps, and now there are six countries that are pilot countries. Uh, they're aided by several advanced countries, particularly Japan and those in the European Union, plus a number of international agencies. And the six are Ethiopia, Ghana, India, Kenya, Serbia, Ukraine, but a number of other countries uh, are considering embarking on this uh, task. Uh, back in November of 2019, I gave a keynote address at the World Science Forum in Budapest on uh, what had happened in science diplomacy over the previous decade and what we might expect for the next decade. And I listed at the end what I thought were the five big issues where science diplomacy needed to, uh, to contribute and could contribute. Uh, they were controlling new technologies of war and advancing arms control treaties, providing foresight and dialogue on implications of new scientific and technological developments, maintaining a channel of communication between estranged nations, accelerating global progress on the SDGs, building SDI capacity and developing and emerging economies. But note, I did not mention a pandemic at all. It just shows you that it's, uh, it's tough to predict the, the future. Now we're in uh, the post-COVID era, or hopefully we're getting to the post-COVID era, uh, at least in parts of the world, hopefully everywhere over the next uh, uh, year or two. The, uh, in 2020, I talked to a number of science and counselors and uh, embassies in Washington, and asked them what their top priority was for science diplomacy. And, Universal answer was uh, vaccine diplomacy. Uh, the initial response to the pandemic in the US was catastrophically poor, which really shocked me. I thought the US would do better than anywhere else. We had 20% of the deaths with only 4% of the population in 2020. And the failures were across the science policy society interface, including some of our scientific institutions like the, like the CDC. But science and technology have rescued the US, the development of new mRNA vaccines, uh, essentially are pulling the U.S. out of the pandemic in, uh, in 2021. And of course, there are many factors in addition to uh, science that uh, influence these big decisions. They come from culture, trust, leadership, history, politics. Uh, and these especially can be dominant when there are large scientific uncertainties. Now, the Biden administration, as I think we all are aware, in its first five months, its domestic priorities have been vaccine delivery the end of the pandemic in the United States and government funding to re help restore our economy. But the remaining big challenges, both domestic and, and international, obviously, domestically reducing the political divisions and building trust in our democracy and science domestically, restoring confidence uh, in the U.S. among allies and confronting the bad behavior of autocratic states. Actually, when I'm recording this talk, it's when uh, uh, Biden and, and Putin uh, are meeting in Switzerland. I also want to emphasize this issue of emerging technologies. They provide uh, great opportunities, threats, and disruptions. It's something that back at the 10-member group we emphasized beginning in 2016 has now become a big topic at the uh, STI forums, and it's something that's being recognized by uh, 
all national leaders, diplomats, and our intelligence uh, agencies. The science revolution is moving so fast uh, that it's creating these opportunities, threats, and disruptions. Uh, one report you might be interested in looking at is the U.S. intelligence agencies produce a public report uh, every four years, released right after the presidential election. Uh, the recent one came out in February of this year, Global Trends 2040, but it talks a lot about the impact of emerging technologies. Of course, the other big issue in the United States, of course, is addressing the, the, uh, the challenge from China and the US. There's agreement, bipartisan agreement on significant funding increases for research and development on these transformational technologies. Uh, Senate bill has passed. I'm sure a House bill is forthcoming soon. Uh, the science community welcomes the funding, but are concerned about some of the new regulations that apply to international scientific collaboration, particularly between US scientists and Chinese scientists. Of course, uh, the U.S. Uh, wants to help develop a consensus among democratic countries on how to advance faster than China regarding science, technology, innovation, move forward aggressively on reducing CO2 emissions and expanding green energy technologies, and assist the developing world on vaccinating everyone and accelerating their uh, economic growth. Now, let me come to the Republic of Korea and the United States, their relationship on science diplomacy, particularly potential collaboration of our foreign ministries. I've listed what I think are the big six issues. The first five are the ones that I had back in that 2019 uh, talk at the World Science Forum, really looking at the perspective of issues in Asia, but controlling the technologies of war, arms control, particularly dealing with North Korea and with China, uh, providing foresight on implications and governance of the these new scientific and technological developments and maintaining a channel of communication between a strange nation. Of course, the DPRK is quite relevant there. And China accelerating progress on the sustainable development goals, perhaps with these roadmaps, uh, building capacity and developing emerging economies. But then of course, improving the ability to deal, to deal better with the, uh, with the next pandemic. We also wanna emphasize in the end about uh, a closer relationship between our two countries on, uh, on research and policy, on the science technology innovation. One of the things I think is basic research is something that we can have more collaboration uh, than we do now, particularly uh, research centers at our universities and research institutes that are funded not only by governments, but also by uh, the private sector. Uh, so working together, in a, working together in areas relevant to global challenges and emerging technologies. Again, reducing the barriers to international scientific collaboration uh, between our countries and other countries, but with appropriate safeguards. And encourage collaboration of, uh, uh, of your uh, Republic of Korea and US scientific and academic institutions to work together on these track two science policy and science diplomacy initiatives that might help to reduce tensions in the Pacific. Uh, well, it's been a, a great pleasure to talk to you this morning. I wish you're well in your discussions and uh, this, this first point I have on this last slide, uh, our two countries can utilize their impressive capabilities in science, technology, and inflation and innovation to influence the development of other countries, increase the role of scientific evidence and decision-making, help solve global challenges and advance peace, security, and prosperity worldwide. Thank you, Dr. Cole uh, Glazier. He talked about a comprehensive uh, science diplomacy, especially between Korea and the US, how to cooperate with each other. And science diplomacy achieve SDG, something that he has been conducted research and vaccine uh, diplomacy as well. He uh, proposed also challenges to take on. So when our discussions engage in discussion, maybe you also need to uh, give some comment on what's been mentioned by Dr. Cole uh, Glazier. Dr. Cole Glazier talked about comprehensive uh, science diplomacy, as is mentioned by the second vice minister. It is uh, for the uh, core prosperity of all humanity. 
that is in line with what's been mentioned uh, by uh, his remarks. So please allow me to introduce uh, today's discussant. And discussant, you are given 40 minutes for discussion for vaccine and also climate change and also emerging uh, technologies. The first discussant is Dr. Tom Pridman from the uh, U.S. In April uh, this year, in his interview with the local uh, media, he, for the first time, insisted that Korea should be a global vaccine production uh, hub and introduced the concept of a global vaccine production hub as a also political uh, concept for Korea. He serves as a president and CEO of a Reserve to Save Lives, a global initiative to prevent epidemics and cardiovascular disease. The second discussant is Professor Kim Sung Hwan. He is teaching physics at Postec and also he's a leading practitioner in the Future Strategy Research Institute. He serves as a chairman of the Korea Physical Society and senior expert member of the National Advisory Council. And also he is he served as a Secretary General Director of the APCTP and AAPPS. And the next discussion is Professor Yu. Now he is a professor of the International Law Center at the Korea National Diplomatic Academy, and his uh, research area is related to cyber space, so new technology related to security. And the last discussant is Dr. Won Young Cho uh, from the Software Policy Research Institute under the Ministry of Science and ICT. He is a team leader of AI policy research. He's actively participating in the designing of the AI, especially between 2010 and 2016. He was a research fellow at the Samsung Economic Research Institute. Maybe he's the right person to give us experience in the private sector. And both also, what was it like to work for the ministry? After discussion, we are going to have a Q&A session for participants online and offline. Those who are at present, please raise your hand if you have opinion. Those who are joining us online, please uh, post your questions on the uh, chat box on YouTube. So for discussion, so you are given two questions, right? The first question was, what are the expected effects, considerations, and challenges in strengthening rock US science and technology diplomacy in four areas of vaccine space, climate change, and emerging technology? And second question is related to keynote presentation delivered by Dr. Cole Glaser. For example, providing prediction on the emerging science and technology development governance and its implications, and also capacity building support for SDI for developing countries, and also acceleration of the implementation of SDG, and also suggesting improvement in also pandemic response capabilities. So in the future, how should we implement uh, it and what should be the focus of the Ministry of Foreign Ministry and if we are going to cooperate with the US then what which institution and in what way should it be done so we would probably attend the video recorded by uh, Dr. Tom, followed by uh, Professor Kim, Professor Yu and also head of the team Cho. So first of all I would like to ask you uh, to listen to the remarks by Dr. Tom Priden. Welcome. Thank you for inviting me to speak with you today. COVID-19 has elevated our collective attention to the concept of global health security. This focuses on the need for strong and resilient public health systems in every country, systems that can prevent, detect, and respond to infectious disease threats wherever and whenever they emerge anywhere in the world. Global health security is integral to national security. It provides economic and political stability and leads to a more productive society. 
Korea has been a leading force since this effort was launched in 2014 and has remained wholeheartedly engaged ever since. The Republic of Korea has led the UN Group of Friends of Solidarity for Global Health Security, which aims to strengthen the UN response and cooperation on global health security, including COVID. The Republic of Korea Ministry of Foreign Affairs has, has appointed two ambassadors at large on global health security. This is a testament to the importance which the Korean government and society place on this issue. However, when we look globally, support for global health security has by and large been insufficient. It's direly needed to successfully address both COVID and future health threats. Increasingly, we see a two-track pandemic where people in some countries are enjoying the benefits of a reopened society and economy, while others continue to suffer restrictions and increasingly mourn their loved ones. Where some high-income countries are now able to vaccinate young people, while many healthcare workers and older people around the globe are yet to be vaccinated. It's been more than six months since the first COVID vaccines were administered. And now high-income countries have administered nearly half of the world's doses, while low-income countries have administered less than half a percent. And this proportion has not changed for months. As vaccine production and distribution lag, the virus continues to spread. This increases the chance that a variant will emerge that renders the vaccine less effective. There's an urgent need to confront global vaccine scarcity head on. We can't afford to lose any more time. President Biden and President Moon have acknowledged that contemporary threats and challenges require a deep partnership in new areas. COVID vaccine production is one such area of critical importance. The Korea-US Global Vaccine Partnership, which aims to strengthen joint response capabilities for infectious disease through international vaccine cooperation, has the potential to change the trajectory of the pandemic, help end it, and prepare the world much better for future health threats. This partnership now has the task to turn this vision into action and reality, to expand manufacturing of, of vaccines that have been demonstrated to be safe and effective that will benefit the entire world. This is crucial, but time is of the essence. Tragically, we have lost too many people already. We must do whatever we can to prevent more deaths, more economic and social dislocation, and to reduce the risk of more dangerous variants emerging. The world needs new manufacturing capacity to rapidly produce billions more vaccine doses above and beyond the commitments that are already in place. We can't afford to delay further. Establishing a distributed system for mRNA vaccine production for global pandemic response is a promising approach. mRNA vaccines have proven exceptionally effective against COVID, and their potential may also extend to other diseases, including influenza. And crucially, mRNA production facilities can be smaller, less expensive, and faster to establish. The US and Korea, using a whole of government and whole of industry approach, could invest to address bottlenecks in supply, retrofit existing non-naive facilities which have already expressed interest, install single-use production equipment, and begin production while ironing out regulatory and financial and import control concerns. It is possible to establish all of this within three to six months, if vaccine originators are incentivized to share mRNA technology. It's important to note that these technologies were developed with public funding. With a regional mRNA production vaccine hub, able to both produce vaccines and serve as a resource where manufacturers from low and middle income countries can learn how to set up and run their own mRNA vaccine production lines under strict licensing and quality controls, we could move from a one-to-one -to, -one to a one-to-many approach. 
from a closed system to an open system, from a dead end of training to a train the trainers. We could diversify production nodes and build resiliency and redundancy in the system. This will avoid single points of failure. If we had started just a few months ago, we would already be producing mRNA vaccines in more places. There's a saying, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is now. And now is the time for the US and the Republic of Korea to work together to help meet global needs, put an end to the pandemic, and better position the world to confront future health threats. Thank you very much. 네, 감사합니다. Thank you so much, Dr. Tom Prison mentioned about distribution problems between advanced and also developing countries and also by uh, Rock US uh, partnership, uh, he, we, he mentioned that we can address the issue. And next, I would like to ask, I would like to invite Professor Kim. Good afternoon. Cora Summit and also uh, Mr. William Cole Gladzier and Tom Frieden's comment made it very clear that we, the, the Republic of Korea, not only have the higher reputation and also higher expectation from outside world, especially our response to the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the way that we are leading the uh, technology advancement and development Many countries are expecting further from Republic of Korea. So many of these issues are related with the science and technology and the scope of it, size of it, and the speed of it is really uh, what really matters. So whether it be discussed in the discussions in the Chorus Summit, summit but also this is something that we have to keep up with the vision of the bilateral relations. There are many considerations that we need to think about. As you already mentioned, so we have to have some basis and fundamental to do it. The human resource, human as, uh, as asset and human exchange. And there are two factors. First, is for the science and technology we have to put more value on it together with the diplomacy so that we can have both science and diplomacy and for that we have to form a human relations and by accumulating it we can have the uh, trust asset and that can be something that speed up our development for that we have to do the cooperation and collaboration so for that, the science and technology, when it comes to diplomacy, the perception on diplomacy should be expanded in the science and technology academia. For that, we have to lower the barrier and also provide more incentive. That should be something we need to do. For that and to that end, there should be many different ways. but. We have to use the diaspora of science and technology, especially this untacked uh, era. Now, as we are using uh, the uh, global human talent pool, that is something that we can do together. And in different levels, we try to activate uh, the mechanisms to stimulate science and technology development. For that, we have to strengthen the capability and also how to pre establish the channel to communicate with the outside world. All those things that I mentioned to be, to, should be combined together in a consorted effort for the private sector actors together with the well-developed collective network, this should be in earnest for us to do the work. And our counterpart, the U.S., 
They have many different groups of experts. They have well-developed uh, and various groups. So we have to do the matching correctly and rightly in a fast manner. Because this time we have to be really onset of the work. We have to be speeding up so that we can live up to the expectation which is higher than ever before. And to support that, not only that, as our President Moon already mentioned, we also have to have the legal basis and the scope itself should be widened for support so that many experts and the scientists can go and come out to do the work. And collaboration should be something that we can do based on that legal basis. And these are something that Mr. Kolkletcher also mentioned and proposed. For better cooperation and collaboration, in the end, the exchange in the science and technology and the co-study, we have to uh, define the meaning of the collaboration in advance and have to do the work. It, not, it does not be the center in the university, but also in the private sectors and the public sectors. And this is something that Mr. Tom Frieden also mentioned. This is something that we can build up so that we have better response capability to yet another pandemic that can be uh, taking uh, place in the future. And while we are having this opportunity for decorous cooperation, maybe we can have a long-term perspective to have a co-research as many projects not only in the field, but also the expansion of the human talent pool is really important. Maybe this is some kind of track two in diplomacy. So in a private sector, we can build private sector's uh, diplomacy-related work to support the diplomacy. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor, for your remarks, especially as the foundation for long-term science and technology diplomacy, you emphasize the human resources and talent. That's the very basic thing, but it is the most difficult thing to secure a human network. Building it cannot be uh, done overnight, and more effort is needed to maintain the human network. So we should take a long-term approach by conducting joint research and to manage and to form our human network. And next, I would like to invite Professor Yu. My name is Chungu Yu, Professor of the Korean National Diplomatic Academy. I was asked to assess the outcome of the ROC US Summit meeting, especially in science, technology, uh, diplomacy. I think ROC US uh, relations uh, have been evolving, and as the uh, President has already mentioned this time, the outcome of the Rock US Summit meeting is uh, future oriented and cooperation in space uh, sector uh, includes not only traditional parts like a military sector, but also science and the technology, which is novel cooperative uh, sector. And they promise to co-respond to uh, threats in space and also building uh, 6G technology by signing an Artemis agreement. That's a very broad uh, cooperation in science and technology and which leads to additional uh, tasks. For example, the ending of the RMG uh, that is related to the development of science and technology, which gives us a potential opportunity to launch our satellite, which needs a potential cooperation with the uh, US and also the essential infrastructure and the industry 4.0 is the development of a KPS. We need to develop our own uh, GPS for military use and our frequency in cooperation with the uh, US. And when it comes to signing an Artemis agreement, that is related to uh, space governance and also international 
a norm. So maybe we need to share data, we need to reduce the, the risks in space sector. There are so many potential uh, tasks for us to implement and also uh, for cooperation and 6G. We have to probably integrate the uh, satellite cloud computing market. Uh, that means we may need to develop further technology and satellite and also big data service, which gives us so many uh, cooperative tasks for the two uh, countries. And there's one more thing to consider for us in the US. There are cooperation for our project and there's a system to respond to space uh, threat. In the case of last year, as for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Japan, Korea, Germany, France, uh, which are part of the nine countries, we have actively adopted and participated in a UN resolution, resolution for reduction in a threat in the space sector which is closely related to the agreement on Artemis. And as Dr. of the Cole Glacier mentioned, then that is related to controlling the technology in novel sectors. Among the controlling in sectors, which include uh, 11 sectors, that includes uh, high-speed aircraft, parentis system, all of which are based on noble uh, technology, which is also closely related to space sector. I think uh, the Rock US uh, cooperation will be very important in that sector. So when it comes to bilateral uh, cooperation, I think uh, the two countries need to be capable of uh, doing that. Only when capability is built, the cooperation uh, is uh, possible for mutual benefit. In retrospective, back in 2014, since the Rock US summit meeting, there was a policy dialogue on space sector, but that dialogue has been suspended uh, and implementation has been suspended for the last four years. But uh, for the last four years, the uh, space technology in Korea has been matured and developed, which has been recognized by, by the U.S., which results in comprehensive cooperation in space sector. So I think this is a sector that uh, garners our attention. Then lastly, fundamentally, rock U.S. cooperation in space needs to be a promoted and needs to make sure it contributes to the governance in the space sector. We have to enhance our capability uh, in Korea. Domestic uh, capability uh, building uh, means that policy and strategy in the space sector needs to be uh, broader. So that needs to be handled at a national level, and also that needs to be in a line uh, with space sector strategy and planning. So according to that, we might need to organize uh, our uh, structure and also build mechanism among related organizations. In terms of the international cooperation, for follow-up measures, as I mentioned before, the ROC US needs to uh, need to build a working uh, group to implement that. And also at the multilateral uh, level, the uh, traveling to the um, moon would be uh, centered on the, the, the US and also the EU and also the uh, Middle East. The three parties are mainly focused on. So we need to also prepare ourselves and we need to come up with responsive projects to that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor. I think uh, he highly highlighted a very important uh, element. He mentioned that uh, 
until we achieve the outcome uh, in the science and technology cooperation. You mentioned that our capability in space technology has been uh, strengthened and enhanced. In order to further develop, in order to implement follow-up measures, uh, we will probably need to prepare ourselves by organizing related uh, organizations and also other measures. Next, I would like to ask Team Leader Cho. Thank you very much. The two panelists talked about in a comprehensive, comprehensive manner on the result and the production of the CORA Summit. Now I will focus on the AI technology, how we can do the CORA's cooperation in the future in detail. The AI technology and international cooperation and co-research, this is not a choice, but an essential part. Already, AI is basically software, and if we can uh, exchange code on internet, the transboundary research is something that we can do very easily. So it is not now, but even in the past, we have wide uh, level of cooperation. And about half of the core research in Korea is done with the Overseas International Research Center. So in particular, global co-research, it's better if we can do the cooperation with an advanced country. As you're well aware, for the past few decades, the U.S. has uh, had a leading role in AI-related technology development. That's why including the AI and other emerging technology, if we can strengthen the cooperation between the two countries, that means it will be uh, an opportunity for our AI technology to go a step further. This is really good first step. Then now the next step is how to do it properly in action. Basically, the U.S. would want something from us, and we want something from the U.S. So our understanding to each other should be met. So we have to find the point that we can do the cooperation on. What should be the things that the U.S. want from us? What is the situation the U.S. is in, in terms of the AI technology development? We have to think about that point. That should be the basis that we can figure out the direction and the target for the cooperation in AI part with the U.S. So under, such, under current situation, unlike in the past where the U.S. have the very strong hegemony, uh, right now we have more like a neck and neck situation. Back in 1960, uh, global AI, the uh, US uh, took about 60 to 70 percent of the proportion in technology development, and 70 it was 50 percent, and it is dropping over time. And the R and D the investment, China, their amount of investment is quite similar to that of the US, while uh, the capacity. Uh, to invest more in the RNA, uh, R&D in our AI, the way that a U.S. can go forward compared to the China is to use countries like Korea, which has the basis and fundamentals for the development. If we can do the cooperation together, then we can share the result together and can go together further than that of the China. And now, one of the global issue here is the contagious diseases, the prevention of the contagious diseases and the response against the climate change. And that means AI for social good. That should be the focus area that we can start the cooperation. And also have to think about the negative impact and also the cases of abuse and disuse of the AI. We also have to do the discussions and the research on that as well. So we can do the midterm and the long-term discussion and the cooperation on that point as well. And second, 
point that the U.S. want to have a cooperation with us in the AI sector, as I already mentioned, to heighten the credibility of the AI, many different countries try to do something to set up the standard and also standard to set the reference. But what the U.S. wants for this is something different from other countries. The EU uh, established a law for the the regulation on AI, which seemed very strong, not promoting it, but strongly repressing it. So unlike that kind of things, the disuse or misuse of the AI on the market is the main point of the U.S. legislation on AI. Such legislation and regulations and the uh, bills that was proposed last year, the target is the big tech companies in the U.S. That means from the position of the U.S. They have to set the standard in a reasonable manner because they have to protect those companies in the U.S. so that they can follow the standard in a reasonable manner and also can make the most of the benefits and the profits in the sector. So for the regulation and the standard, they also want to have a cooperation with us to set the international standard to get together. And Mr. Dr. Cole Kledier, uh, among his remarks, I want to make some points. The credibility of the AI and development and the use of the AI, there should be some essential rules that we need to abide by. We have to create those rules. Many countries are working on it, but OECD and G7, they are the ones who are working on it. And we also should be the one uh, to have the international cooperation have to set the principles that we can share with the outside world. And while doing that, we also can have our profits and our advantages based on that uh, rules. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Team Leader Cho, for very uh, useful remarks. Yes. In effect, when it comes to cooperation with other countries, we need to fully understand intention of uh, a partner uh, country. And he, I think, he's a remarkable limited to AI, but we don't have to limit our perspective to the AI. We need to uh, fully understand the perspective of change in the US. I think his remarks was very useful in terms of that. And preparation for the Rock US summit meeting. I was in charge of preparing the item for climate uh, change. In the past, I've been in charge of negotiating climate change issues, even from the Obama administration. And the biggest change I feel about is in line with the remarks by uh, Tim Lee Dal Cho. Uh, during the Obama administration, uh, they wanted to cooperate with Korea in climate change, and they wanted to encourage Korea to dramatically reduce and make more effort for addressing uh, climate change, kind of limited to the scope of the Korean Peninsula. But this time, as is mentioned by discussant, by holding a hand together, by cooperating with uh, Korea. I think the scope of cooperation became uh, broader on how to help other developing countries to reduce the use of fossil fuel and how to cooperate with the Korea by uh, securing more financial resources for developing countries. I think that's the expectation from the US. So. There has been change in the U.S. perspective. So I think in terms of that, we need to really well understand what they want to achieve together, including the Dr. Uh, Tim Pridden. Four presenters gave us very useful insight due to time constraint. Are there any uh, questions among those who are at uh, present? Please raise your hand if you do have.
please uh, identify yourself and affiliation. My name is Pak uh, from the Science and Technology and Diplomacy Research Institute. It's not a uh, question, but an opinion. Uh, among what's been mentioned by Dr. Cole Glazer, I think there are things that are not touched upon. SDG and F for SDG, F STI for SDG. So many keywords are touched upon, and for sustainable development, I think I think the role of innovative science and technology is important. I think these days that part has been neglected and overlooked. When we try to achieve SDG, we have to uh, think that how we are going to achieve our SDG goal and how we are going to help developing countries to achieve their SDG goals. So STI is very useful for SDG achievement. That's a very useful tool. So by cooperating with advanced countries, how we are going to utilize the science and technology to achieve our SDG goal. And in other words, how we are going to develop our initiative to uh, provide the support for developing countries to achieve uh, their SDG goal. I think this is the area which deserves uh, more attention than before. Thank you. Are there other people who would like to raise a question or add a comment? Hi, my name is Journalist Moon from the Herald Economy Daily. I have a question for DG Lee and you uh, and also my question is directed to uh, professor who mentioned the agreement on Artemis. With related to uh, climate uh, change, which is a very important uh, global issue, but in the EU, there is a, a carbon a boundary adjustment mechanism that's been mentioned by the EU. Uh, in the US, in order to achieve a carbon neutrality, the uh, US has said that they are going to wield their leadership. But for developing countries, I think it is another imperialism, green imperialism by advanced countries. For uh, climate change, we promise to cooperate with each other, with the US, but the US perspective is related to uh, the need for technological development, but are there norms and also patent uh, uh, issues uh, addressed? I think it could be another form of uh, hegemony in the future, potential hegemony in the future. So I think there are risks lingering. And in order to make sure that does not lead to another hegemony, how can we uh, adjust uh, our cooperation with the US in the framework of joint statement and with the related agreement on Artemis? I think those are controversial uh, issues uh, which uh, is related to the violation of the norms. There is a competition uh, getting fiercer over the uh, space sector by signing an Artemis agreement, I think uh, we become a part of contentious issue, uh, meaning that Korea is violating the international law. Journalist Moon, thank you for asking a question. As I mentioned, for developing countries, the issues related to carbon neutrality and also how to address the climate uh, change. They might feel that they are forced to implement rather oppressive and strong policies to uh, Korea as Korea is heavily dependent on the uh, import from other countries. Yes, we do share the same view. Before Biden administration took office, President Moon announced a declared carbon neutrality last year. And for corporate spirit over humanity, we agreed to reduce the temperature rise by under 1.5 Celsius degrees to return it to pre-industrialization era. 
in order to prevent the temperature increase by under 1.5 Celsius degrees. And the policy direction has been calibrated to that. I think it is successful. On the occasion of a Rock US summit meeting, the two countries share the same view. And in the future, the, the chair country of the OECD secretariat meeting uh, is the US and also vice secretariat is Korea. So I think there is a shared direction. I do not want to use the word uh, hegemony. So it is more related to uh, cooperation for green transition. We cooperate with each other for that. And also, we should not forget that the two countries uh, share the same view. We need to provide support for developing countries. We are committed to green transition. And for advanced countries to pursue that direction, Korea being and between advanced and developing countries, we would probably play our role as a bridge between them. Artemis, and when it comes to the violation of international space law, it's about the resource use and the limitations in the guideline. That is something that we should not have the situation where one country own all of the resources in the space. So that is some concerning part that we are having. Now we are working on developing another law, international law, to prevent that. But we have conflicting interests. That's why we cannot have another law yet. But among 10 advanced countries in the space development, the China, by changing its law, allowing the private ownership of space asset. So thinking about that situation in conclusion, those rules and the laws, now we have some vacancies in the international law now, but in the future, the regime, international regime, maybe deep sea and the North Pole should be two main areas that we have in the national law to uh, have the standard. And about uh, many different countries, we are investing so much money in it. So this is something that we have to put much cautions on and keep eye on. Thank you. The questions raised by our journalist uh, Moon uh, is related to uh, the uh, space uh, sector. And I believe that the cooperation in this sector is like a very much desirable uh, change. Is there more question? No. I would like to thank you all for staying with us until the very end of this session. Thank you so much.